See, some of us have memorized some songs and different things in our lives, but we forget the book of Allah. And before I go any further, I'd like to ask you a question. Three questions. You already know this. Everywhere I go, I have to ask this question. And I want the roof of this place to come down, inshallah. And your first, are you ready, yeah? Why is only one person? So someone got, are you not ready? The first question is, who is your Lord? Now start again, start again. I want it to echo through the streets of Manchester, inshallah. Who is your Lord? Allah. Where is your deen? Allah. And who is your prophet? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear respected brothers and sisters, for those of you that are here, for those of you that are at home, I'm going to ask that same question again. But I want every single one of you to close your mouth. And I want you to answer it while your mouth is closed. Who is your Lord? Where is your deen? And who is your prophet? And this is the situation we're in today, in this day and age, where if we really believed in the who is our Lord, who is Allah, where is our deen, which is Islam, and who is our prophet, which is the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we would live by the same way we answered the first time. But every single one of us, we have this grudge against one another. We're sick and tired of this. Every single brother or sister that we know of online has got beef with one another. We need to put this aside. We're Muslims. Our actions, our behavior and our sins has an impact on every single Muslim out there. I'm sick and tired of Muslims bashing each other day in, day out. Go up. Be a Muslim. Know what it takes to be a Muslim. We're sick and tired of this. Or you not? And some of us, we live by this green card like we are going to get to Jannah. Wallah al azim we're far from that. We need to change our ways. The change starts today. You probably had an intention to not even come here today. Rectify your intention, inshallah, where you walk away from this event to better yourself in every aspect. Someone asked me a question at one of my events, and he said, yeah, Amen. what made you fall in love with the Qur'an? I said, I'm going to be honest with you. I fell in love with the Qur'an through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he was described as a walking Qur'an. The moment I fell in love with the Prophet, this is something that you don't need to understand. Well, wherever the Qur'an touches, blesses. The Qur'an came down on a month. It became the month of Ramadan. It became the best month of the year. The Qur'an came on a day. Laylatul Qadr became the best of nights during that month. The Qur'an touched the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it was allocated to him, not any other Prophet, but him. And what did he do? It made him become the best of creation. And this is your Prophet. This is my Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I understand we live in the West. And do you know why? while we live in the West, we have watered down the Islam to benefit our desires. You see, the Tabi'een say, they said, they said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the angels with intellect. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the animals with desires. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the insan with both the intellect and the desires. If we follow our desires, that's going to get us become to the low of the low like the animals. Any desire that takes you away from the book of Allah, any desire that displeases Allah, any desire that takes you away from disobeying Allah, understand you're going to be as low as the animals. But there are certain desires that we have, it's okay. We need to. The desire to eat in order for us to survive. The desire to sleep in order for us to function day in and day out. But if those desires that we do on a daily basis, that we fall into sin, such as drugs, such as not establishing the basics of Islam, such as being in haram relationship, Wallahi, I understand it's difficult, but it's easy for you to complete half of your deen. You're making it difficult for yourselves. And those that follow their desires that's bringing them closer to Allah, 
I'm following the intellect that brings them closer to Allah. Understand, you're going to be as high as the malaika. You're going to be on the same level as the angels, if not even above them. So ask yourself, O oh Muslim, why is it that every single one of us are playing this victim mentality? I'm speaking for the youth. I'm speaking for those that are not practicing the deed of Allah properly. I'm there. I fall into states of jahiliyyah on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. We all do. Sometimes we slip up with our language. Sometimes with our behavior. Sometimes with our actions and our etiquette and our manners. But we need to change our ways. Look at what's happening to the people of Palestine. They, we may not be there with them, but alhamdulillah, we are there with them here, inshallah, in spirit, and at the same time, they're in our du'as. Understand this, there's one ayah that comes to mind that is beloved to me in, in the Qur'an. And this ayah is from Surah Yusuf. And wallahi, if every single sister, or brother, or father, or uncle, or mother, or auntie, imp practices this ayah to the best of their abilities, understand this, you're going to fall into a better position financially, physically, verbally, mentally, you name it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you out. This ayah is something that my mom taught me. And the ayah is, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ That I only complain of my grief and my worries to Allah. Haven't you been there, oh dear sister? Haven't you been there, oh dear brother? Where it's come to a times where you open up to your best friend. You told them about your trials and your tribulations. You told them about your struggle. And what do they do? They share your secrets with other people to laugh at you. Haven't you been there? Where you trusted a brother, you trusted your sister. Yusuf السلام, was betrayed by his own brothers. So you think me and you are not going to get betrayed? Of course we are. But there is one thing that brings us comfort in this world. It's understanding that the only company we have in this world is the company of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't need no friends. I don't need no family. Whoever I attach my heart to, other than Allah, will always go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I attach my heart to my mom. Overly attached my heart to my mom. Then I became to realize, yeah, amen, that everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when death came knocking on her door, Allah returned her back to him. And I ask you, my dear respected sister and brother, one day that door is going to come and knock in for you. You go ask yourself, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy with me? Have I memorized the Quran? Have I implemented it? The companions, radiallahu anhu, when they used to read the Quran, when they used to do that, you didn't used to go any further until they implement every single ayah. The Islam, you can't pick and choose. Islam is not based on your emotions. Islam is based on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allocated for this ummah. There was many prophets that came before us and many prophets that came before us had their own book. But the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa got gifted and honored with this book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are we not honored to have a Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as our Prophet? Are we not honored before every single creation that came before us? We will enter Jannah before them. Is this not an honor? Because Islam gives you honor. It's not your status in society. Islam gives you your dignity. Islam gives you a status. And best believe if you go by the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are promised Jannah. Something as basic as a shadu an la ilaha illallah. You pray your five daily prayers. You fast your monthly, I mean, sorry, you fast your month of Ramadan. You establish your zakah, which is 2.5% of your wealth. There's brothers and sisters fighting about how much they're going to give in zakah. I've been there. I've seen it. Brother has 140 grand to pay for a construction site. The moment it came to giving zakah, he goes, I don't want to give it. I'd rather pay for my house in this dunya. 2.5%. And the last is your hajj. You follow by these, you will understand, you will go a long way, inshallah wa ta'ala. Now I'm going to ask you, my dear respected brother and sister, has Islam ever let you down? Has the Quran ever let you down? And how many music songs have we listened to? For the man that you listen to drill, hip hop, whatever it may be. How many times do we listen to these things and we get that little buzz? 
But when we listen to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a ripple effect throughout the week, throughout the days, throughout the months. But we've neglected the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've neglected the only thing in order for us to have a connection with Allah is the book. Our actions, yes, alhamdulillah. Our ibadah, yes, alhamdulillah. We pray our five times a day. And for those of you that don't pray, wallahi, I'm not here to let you down. I want every single one of you to meet me in Jannah. And if you don't see me in Jannah, then ask about me. Maybe it takes you to ask about me in order for me to go to Jannah, inshallah. But think about this. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the difference between us and the non-believers is salah. How many of us neglect and delay the salah? So many of us. Why? I remember when I was in Denmark, there was a brother that came to me. He goes to me, I've worked in this field because he works in the airport. He said, for years I didn't pray. I used to go home and I used to join all of my salahs together. But he said, after coming to, we did a talk in, uh, in, in Denmark. He said, the very next day I went to, I went to work and I started telling my boss, it's time for me to pray salat al dhuhr it's time for me to pray Salatul Asr. He said, Wallahi, in years of my life that I've worked with him, the same boss, the moment I started doing that, he started showing me more love and respect. You see what happens when you put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first? When you prioritize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, I understand my dear respected sister or brother. We live in the West, there's a struggle. The struggle is that every single thing is attacking Islam. What's the best way for you to show everyone that you come across and that you don't come across that Islam, it is a gifted and honored religion to follow? It's through your actions. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, it is upon a, it's from a Muslim that doesn't concern himself in things that, that, no, it's from a Muslim that doesn't get himself involved in things that doesn't concern you. How many of us see videos on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and everybody likes to make a comment? Everybody likes to make a comment based on their emotions. Let me make it clear to you, brother or sister. I couldn't give a damn. Be hurt. If I say something, if the next sheikh says something, or whoever says, if your feelings get hurt, we don't care. We speak, as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, speak even if it's against yourself. Speak the truth. If you're hurting, I'm hurting. We're here as one. He also described this ummah as one body. If you, my sister, or you, my brother, is hurting, understand I'm affected. If the ummah is bleeding, we're all bleeding. You already seen what's happening. It is time for us to make a change. Wallahi, the best way I fell in love with the Quran was through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I read about his struggles. This is a man that when he was born. He never even had a father. This is a man that lost his mother at six years old. So don't tell me, wherever your father or mother goes back with this backward mentality, coming from back home and their culture, by sticking it on you and putting you down, you still have to have sabrun jameel. A beautiful patience. I've had Muslims that have just come to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have told me, I still have to, what, what ways can I do in order for my parents to become a Muslim? I tell them it's something simple. What you need to do is make da'wah come out of your speech, your actions and your character. They don't even need to read the book of Allah first and foremost. Let your actions be the biggest da'wah. You see, we're Muslims by default. We were brought up in this world. Our families are Muslim. So we naturally, by default, we follow their ways. I remember there was a time in my life when I used to pray Salah because it was a habit. Because I was told from young, I need to pray the Salah because it's a habit. Then it came to a, a realization when I went to prison, I realized the beauty, the tranquility, the peace that I got from praying. And alhamdulillah, once I started doing that, every single Salah that we pray, should be like our last salah. I know my sisters are struggling with hijab, but we don't put them down. And some brothers want to go out of their way by putting them down. Brother, what about the hijab of the brothers? Your character is your hijab. Your aura is your hijab. Your etiquette and your manners is your hijab. So don't ever get onto sisters because wallahi, 
We've met sisters on the road while giving da'wah that don't establish the hijab. And they know better Quran and have better tajweed than me and you put together. And I know sisters that finish the Quran. Yes, they may not wear or, or practice the abaya, but they, they finish the Quran every three days. But when was the last time we as men finished the Quran? We're so busy pointing fingers at people. But we have to sometimes judge by what is apparent. And what is apparent? Islam has been kicked to the side. Islam has become secondary. We need to make Islam our priority. We need to make the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our priority. We need to make sure that whatever we do, inshallah wa ta'ala, to please Allah to our best of our abilities. And if you're struggling, keep that struggle between yourself and Allah. That you only complain of your grief and your worries to Allah. And this is what you need to do, inshallah wa ta'ala. This is just a quick point from me. And if I've ever hurt any of you, then forgive me for the sake of Allah. And if you don't forgive me, then go to the supermarket and get yourself some paracetamol. Make sure it aids your pain. I'm not bothered. الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم إن زلزلة الساعة شيء عظيم يوم ترونها تذهل كل مرضعة عما أرضعت وتضع كل ذات حمل حملها وترى الناس سكارى وترى الناس سكارى وما هم بسكارى وما هم بسكارى ولكن عذاب الله شديد ومن الناس من يجادل في الله بغير علم ويتبع كل شيطان مريد كتب عليه أنه من تولاه فأنه يضله فأنه يضله ويهديه إلى عذاب السعير يا أيها الناس إن كنتم في ريب من البعث فَإِنَّا خَلَقَنَاكُمْ مِنْ تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ ثُمَّ مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ ثُمَّ مِنْ عَلَقَةٍ ثُمَّ مِنْ مُضْغَةٍ ثُمَّ مِنْ مُضْغَةٍ مُخَلَّقَةٍ وَغَيْرِ مُخَلَّقَةٍ لِنُبَيْنَ لَكُمْ وَنُقِرُّ فِي الْأَرْحَامِ مَا نَشَاءُ إِلَى أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى ثم نخرجكم طفلا ثم لتبلغوا أشدكم ومنكم من يتوفى ومنكم من يرد إلى أرذل العمر 
وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرَدُّ إِلَىٰ أَرْذَ لِلْعُمُرِ لِكَيْ لَا يَعْلَمَ مِنْ بَعْدِ عِلْمٍ شَيْئًا وَتَرَى الْأَرْضَ هَامِدَةً فَإِذَا أَنْزَلْنَا عَلَيْهَا الْمَاءِ فإذا أنزلنا عليها الماء اهتزت وربت اهتزت وربت وأنبتت من كل زوج بهيج ذلك بأن الله هو الحق وأنه يحيي الموتى وأنه على كل شيء قدير وأن الساعة آتية لا ريب فيها وأن الله يبعث من في القبور ومن الناس من يجادل في الله بغير علم ولا هدى ولا هدى ولا كتاب منير ثاني عطفه ليضل عن سبيل الله له في الدنيا خزي ونذيقه يوم القيامة عذاب الحريق ذلك بما قدمت يداك وأن الله ليس بظلام للعبيد ومن الناس من يعبد الله على حرف فإن أصابه خير نطمأن به وإن أصابته فتنة انقلب على وجهه خسر الدنيا والآخرة ذلك هو الخسران المبين يدعو من دون الله ما لا يضره وما لا ينفعه ذلك هو الضلال البعيد يدعو لمن ضره أقرب من نفعه لبئس المولى ولبئس العشير إن الله يدخل الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات جنات جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار إن الله يفعل ما يريد Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can you shout back at me the salam, inshallah? I just want to hear you, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is my first time in the UK. I need to see the people, but the spotlights, mashallah, tabarakallah, blinding me. So at least I can hear that there are some people in the audience, mashallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah. والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم my dear respected brothers and sisters in islam 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and reward you for coming out during this very windy and rainy and cold weather. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make every step that you have taken to this place in the scale of your good deeds. Ameen, Rabbil Alameen. How many of you here, my brothers and sisters, and by show of hands, I'll try to squeeze my eyes to see if there are hands in the audience. Uh, how many people here, the first thing in the morning, when you wake up, the first thing in the morning, you check your phone. Just raise up your hand. Be honest. Don't worry. Mufti Mink is not here. No worry. All right. How many of us are still into watching TV series, sitcom, movies? Allahu Akbar. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'oon. Today I wanted to talk about addiction, as Brother Ayman mentioned. But I also wanted to bring to your attention something very interesting, and that is the Quran, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is such an amazing book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed for our guidance. And the more you read of the same thing, the more insights and the more lessons you would deduce. Brother Ayman just mentioned about Surah Yusuf, and he was talking about the Prophet Yusuf and his struggle. Today I will use the same surah, insha'Allah, to deduce seven lessons that maybe can help those people who are addicted to the devices, addicted to gaming. Anyone into gaming here? Raise your hand. Anyone into gaming? Don't worry, Wallahi, Mufti is not here. Don't worry. Why are you guys afraid? No. <laughs> Anyone into social media? Of course, everybody. Anyone into... Um, what is the most popular platform here in the UK? Social media like why? TikTok, you guys TikToking a lot? Anyone into Instagram? Uh, I mean Instagram? Insta <laughs> Insta Allah Musta'an. May Allah protect us all, Ya Rabbi. So maybe those seven traits of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam as described in the Quran perhaps will offer some insight to tame our desires. to tame our desires and our wants. Because human beings, there is no end to our desires and what we wanted to do in life. And sometimes that impact the main purpose of our existence. And that is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah mentioned in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created jinn, spiritual beings, nor mankind except to worship me. We were born to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But along the journey of life, many things can distract us and take us farther away from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for. So what is the first lesson, inshallah, that I wanted to share with you today? Number one, the courage to reach out elders, mentors, family members, the courage to reach out to those people who know, who know more. Prophet Yusuf السلام, when he saw that dream, he reached out to his father and he mentioned, If qala Yusuf li abihi ya abati inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaba inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaba Oh my father, I have seen 11 stars and the moon and the sun and the moon I have seen them prostrating to me. Yusuf السلام, at a very young age, he realized that he don't have enough experience to understand the interpretation of the dream. And as a result, he went to his father and his father guided him through. And this is one of the things that many people who are stuck with their addictions, whether you are addicted to social media or online shopping or gaming or even pornography, we don't have the courage to reach out to people and tell them, help us. Because of the shame and the guilt that we carry sometimes when we are addicted to these vices. The Prophet ﷺ, in a very authentic narration, a man came to him. It was narrated that the man came to him in the presence of other companions and he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, then leave his zina. O Messenger of Allah, allow me to commit zina. 
allow me to commit adultery. Can you imagine if any of us would go to any imam in any masjid, in any place on planet earth and ask him for something like this, what will happen to us? What would be the reaction of this imam? What would be the reaction of the community? But because the Prophet ﷺ opened that space, that safe zone for people to come forward and inquire about their struggles, the man didn't find it heavy or didn't feel ashamed to come and tell the Prophet ﷺ, look, I'm stuck with this addiction. Give me permission to commit it. And the Prophet ﷺ did not rebuke the man. He didn't even say haram in that context, in the context of that story. He didn't even tell the man that this is haram. But rather, because he knew, he knew that the man knew that it is haram. And he's not coming to know whether it's halal or haram anyway. He's coming to find a solution. And this is what we are lacking in our community. We talk a lot about what is halal and what is haram, but we don't facilitate some methodologies and strategies for people who are stuck with haram activities and they don't know how to get out of it. And the Prophet ﷺ asked him questions after questions to make him realize on his own that he was asking about something really awful. He said, do you want this to happen to your mom? Do you want this to happen to your sister, to your daughter, to your aunt? And the man in every question would say, no, no, no. Then the Prophet ﷺ concluded, other people too don't like this to happen to their mothers, to their sisters, to their daughters, and so on. And the Prophet ﷺ prayed for the man, Ya Allah, purify his, his heart and protect his chastity. So my brothers, my sisters in Islam, lesson number one from Surah Yusuf, from the Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to reach out for help when you need. Reach out for guidance when you need. Number two, avoid isolation. Avoid loneliness. Addiction loves isolation. Once you are behind closed doors, you are a loser. If you are addicted to any vices on the internet especially. You see, the brothers of Yusuf, he said, They said to the father that if the wolf would eat our brothers while we are groups, while we are, you know, a clan, strong people around him, then we are definitely losers. But the lesson is, when Yusuf السلام, was alone around his envious brothers, he was thrown in the well. Later on, he learned from this lesson when he was alone with a beautiful lady who was seducing him for haram. This time, he ran away to the opposite direction and we, as we will describe in a, a little while later. But in our context today, my brothers and sisters in Islam, the one thing that we are really addicted to, and no exception here, is our cell phones is our cell phones. Try to now think about it. Would you like to be attached to the Quran, to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which you have come and attended an entire conference about it, the divine inspiration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You came here to learn about the, the Quran. Would you rather be attached to the Quran every morning instead of touching your phone and, and go through, you know, endless posts on your social media or read the Quran for a little while and then go and check your emails and check other news on your devices? Whether, would you rather be addicted to your phone or attached to the Quran? And the reason I use two different words is that any addiction by definition is a negative thing. So whatever you're addicted to, this addiction is impactful and it has an impact on your very, stru the structure of your brain. Any addiction, but attachment, not necessarily so. So instead of saying I'm addicted to the Quran, say I'm attached to the Quran. Instead of I'm addicted to the masjid, I'm attached to the masjid. Believe it or not, even the Prophet Sallallahu make a distinction between both words. In the hadith about the seven people who will be sheltered under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, the Prophet said, وَرَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ And a man whose heart is attached to the masjid. He did not use the word addiction here. 
But in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ talked about mudmin khamr, a person who's addicted to alcohol. He, he made clear distinction because addiction is always harmful where attachment is not necessarily so. So avoid isolation. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu arda, he said, alaykum bil jama'a wa iyyakum wal furqa. Stick to the congregation, stick to the groups, and beware of being divided and being alone. فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ مَعَ الْوَاحِدِ وَهُوَ مِنَ الْإِثْنَيْنِ أَبْعَدِ For indeed, shaitan is always with the individual. And when shaitan is around you, he's not there to keep you entertained or to offer you some barbecue. He's there to trap you into sin, to drag you into haram. فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ مَعَ الْوَاحِدِ Shaitan is always with the individual. وَهُوَ مِنَ الْإِثْنَيْنِ أَبْعَدِ And he's farther away from the two. Once you are with the righteous companies, shaitan will never win that battle. Number three, my brothers and sisters in Islam, judgment and knowledge. Powerful tools to protect you against temptations is to increase your knowledge about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a result, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you with the right judgment to make the right decision in the right time. Allah will grant you that wisdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, And when he reached an age of, of maturity, we granted him, we, we provided him with the right judgment and knowledge. And Allah concluded the ayah by saying, and this is the way how we reward those who do good. So in order for you to be able to accumulate knowledge and reach out to that level of wisdom, you need to start doing righteous actions. By the token of time, all of us, my brothers and sisters in Islam, are in a state of loss. By default, we are in a state of loss. If we enter Jannah, it's by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not because you are smart. Except those who have faith, who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And do righteous deeds. May Allah make us among them. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Number four, my brothers and sisters in Islam, run to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't ever give up on Allah. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Tell them, O Muhammad, tell my servants who have transgressed against themselves day and night. Tell them, despair not from the mercy of Allah, for Allah forgive all sins, minor or major. It doesn't matter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say, لا صغيرة مع إصرار ولا كبيرة مع استغفار. Minor sins are no longer considered or looked at by Allah as minor if you insist on committing them. And major sins are no longer considered major by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your constant istighfar, with your constant return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So run to Allah. When Yusuf alayhi salam was seduced by Imratul Aziz, a beautiful and a lady of authority, he said what? Qala ma'ad Allah. I seek the protection of Allah now. I have no one to run to but to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't ever think that just because you have sinned again and again, that Allah doesn't love you. Don't think ever that Allah had given up on you. Allah will never get bored unless you become bored. I have been counseling people who are addicted to this filth for many, many years. Believe it or not, my brothers and sisters in Islam, many of them have left Islam. And I'm not... I'm not worried about saying that publicly because it is the truth and it is happening on a pace that is so scary. Why is that so? Because they are addicted 
and then they repent, and then they relapse after a couple of days, after a couple of weeks, and then they repent, and then they, they've been into that vicious cycle for years and years and years until they have reached their conclusion, Billah, that Allah is not there. Don't ever give up on Allah. So long as you're breathing, there is a reason for it. Allah is giving you an opportunity to run to Him before it is too late. Number five, my brothers and sisters in Islam, run away. So run to Allah by seeking His help and aid, but also run away from any place where the sins usually are committed. You know the cycle already. Once you are in your bedroom, your cell phone is next to you, your laptop is next to you, your internet data is free, is available. You know it's coming. You know the cycle. So break that cycle before you fall back again and then regret it. The Pro Prophet Yusuf السلام, he was locked in a room. He was, he was locked in a room by this lady. الأبواب, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said she locked the doors, she put guards outside, no one exits, no one come in. And then she told him what? Hey, talak, I'm all yours. How many men in the room will resist some, such temptation? How many men in the room will say no to such shaitan? He ran away from her in that small room. I was reading this surah again and again. And every time I would ask myself, where was Prophet Yusuf السلام, running to? Where was he running to? Small room, all locked. Where were you running to? I do not care. Wherever the sin is about to commit, I am not here. I have to run to the opposite direction. He ran to the opposite direction to a point that she ripped off his shirt from behind. Leave your room, open the door, shut your phones in the night, put it outside, away from your bedroom. You know the cycle, break it, and inshallah ta'ala, you will be able to break free from these vices, inshallah. Number six, something very important. Don't ever, my brothers and sisters in Islam, use your beauty or your good look to trap people or to drag people into haram. Don't ever think that because Allah had given you something that can attract others, you could use it in your advanced, you know, in, in your advantage. billah and commit the haram. Prophet Yusuf السلام, according to one narration, he was given half of the beauty of the universe. This is how handsome he was. Yet he did not use this to commit haram. billah. He did not. In fact, all the ladies that uh, were invited to look at him, they said, Malakun Kareem, this man is an angel. He's not a human being. Yet he never used that to commit haram. If Allah had given you something, use it to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lower your gaze, Allah said. Tell to the believing men to lower your gaze when you talk to the opposite gender. Be careful, don't just stare freely. And don't talk unnecessarily also. Same apply to the sisters. There is a connection between lowering the gaze and protecting your private parts and your chastity. That's what Allah said in the Quran. Tell to the believing men, lower your gaze. As a result, your chastity will be protected. Because the eyes, the stare at that which is haram, the Prophet described it as an arrow from the arrows of shaitan. So stay away. Don't ever look at the beauty of others and don't ever use your own beauty to drag people to haram. And final point that I want to share with you, inshallah ta'ala, my brothers and sisters in Islam, restrict yourself. Restrict yourself instead of dying in a vicious cycle of sinful activities. Restrict yourself for a year, for two. Seek out help, as we said earlier, but also restrict yourself. What do I mean by that? Islam had given us a beautiful system. Can anyone tell me why in Ramadan, all of a sudden, from dawn to sunset, water became ha haram? The very water that we drink and we take for granted during the month of Ramadan, from dawn to sunset, becomes haram for you. Your very wife and husband from dawn to sunset becomes haram for you. Why Allah is doing this to us? 
to restrict you, to train you, to tame your desires, so that when you stand later on in front of any haram activities, it would be easy for you to say no. But whenever you desire something, you go for it? Are we animals? May Allah protect us all, Ya Rabbi. And may Allah enable us to control these desires. Ameen, Ya Rabbi Alameen. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu arda once was walking and he saw one of the companions carrying a piece of meat on his shoulder. And he told him, what is it that you're carrying? He said, a piece of meat that I desired it, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. I desired it, oh, you know, leader of the believers. He said, Awa kullama ashtahayt ashtarayt. Is it that every time you desire something, you go for it? We have to restrict ourselves and tame our desires, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Even Yusuf alayhi salam, they threatened him. They threatened him that if he, if he do not comply with the haram, with the inquiry of committing zina, he will be thrown in jail. قَالَ رَبِّ السِّجْنُ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا يَدْعُونَنِي إِلَيَّ He said, Wallah, Ya Allah, O oh my Lord, bear witness that prison is more beloved to my heart than what they are inviting me to. I'd rather be, be thrown behind bars than committing haram. Abdullah ibn Hudaf al-Sahmi, radiallahu anhu arda, one of the people who fought against the Roman Empire during the era of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu arda, and he was taken captive, he and 300 of the companions. They were trying to convert them to Christianity. And they started with the leader, Abdullah ibn Hudaf al-Sahmi. And he refused and refused and he showed how stubborn he is. He said, I will never leave the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for a blinking of an eye. This is how tough, how strong he was, how steadfast he was. They sent after him in his cell a prostitute. They knew that once he committed zina, he's broken. He ran away from her, my brothers, my sisters in Islam, until she felt tired. She left the cell and she said, he is a rock. This is what we need to develop in our lives, my brothers and sisters in Islam. And the, the real life example that we have today that taught us all faith in action, resilience in action, are the people of Gaza, the people of Palestine. Wallahi, we never imagined in our existence that, we'll see, that we will see little kids, little kids supporting each other, supporting their people in Palestine, giving them shahada before they die. We never seen this. We never thought that we would see this. We never seen in our existence a mother screaming from far distance, saying, that my, my four kids are on fire. We never seen. A father bearing his own old children and saying, Inshallah, we marry you to Hur al Ain. This is faith in action. And if we want to bring Palestine back, we need to work on ourselves. There's no nation that will ever revive with any addictive behavior that I just mentioned briefly today. May Allah protect us all from these vices. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant victory to our brothers and sisters in Palestine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring back Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa to those who deserve it. The Arab Palestinians, Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen. And before I leave the stage, my brothers, my sisters in Islam, I took permission from my dear brother Yasin and the organizers that I want to say something and I want you to repeat after me. Are we ready, inshallah? Are you alive, guys? Alhamdulillah, they are alive. I can hear people talk. But can you shout at me as loud as you can, inshallah? Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Jazakumullahu khayran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله My brothers and sisters, let's first of all begin with a dua for our brothers and sisters in Palestine. This is how I would like to begin the talk today. اللهم إنا نسألك بأسمائك الحسنى وصفاتك العلا أن تحفظ إخواننا في غزة وفي فلسطين وفي كل مكان. We ask you, O oh Allah, with all your glorious attributes and your lofty names, to bless and protect our brothers and sisters in Gaza and in Palestine and everywhere around the world. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change their fear into security and to protect them inside and out and to relieve them from their hardship very soon. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unite their martyred ones with the martyrs, the prophets and the shuhada. O oh Allah, make their children who were slain awaiting for them at the fountain and make them intercessors for them at the doors of paradise. O oh Allah, do not let their struggles and sacrifice go in vain. O oh Allah, return the Muslims to your religion in a good way. O oh Allah, unite the people against injustice. O oh Allah, forgive us for our shortcomings. O oh Allah, change the hearts and allow justice to prevail. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. My brothers and sisters, thank you for having me here. I want to begin with a verse of the Qur'an that is very appropriate for this theme. The theme is the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim, Bismillahir rahmanir rahim, Ya ayyuhan nasu qad jaa فَبِذَلِكَ فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِّمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ Allah says in chapter 10 verse 57 and 58 O people, now he has come to you an exhortation, a reminder from your Lord, a healing for the ailments of the hearts, and a guidance and mercy for those who believe. Tell them, O Prophet, tell them. Let them rejoice and celebrate in Allah's grace and mercy through which this book, the Qur'an, has come to you. It is better than all the riches that they accumulate. Have you heard that verse in the Qur'an before? Have you come across it? This is a reason for every believer to celebrate. In fact, every non-believer in the world, if they understood the meaning and the gift of the Qur'an, the words of Allah to our hearts, it is a gift which we celebrate night and day. This Qur'an, which has not changed even with a letter. For 1,400 years, the challenge remains. Bring one chapter like it. The shortest chapter is which? Which is the shortest surah, brothers and sisters? Which one? How many verses? How many verses? Three. How many lines if we were to write it? Less than two lines. One and a half lines. A little preppy roll, you know, a preppy, grade one. If you tell them to write one line and a half, they can write it. The Quran says, bring one line and a half like the Quran. And no one has been able to even bring one line and a half. Brothers and sisters, rejoice over the Qur'an which Allah has sent as a healing for the heart. In a book which I read, a study which is called Maternal Care and Maternal Health by John Bowlby. He's a very famous psychiatrist, psychologist, a British psychologist, and he's a great reference. He's also a psychoanalyst who is often referenced in scientific studies, he said, 
he made the term called the attachment theory. Hands up if you've heard of that, the attachment theory. Good, we have a few of our sisters, none of our brothers. The attachment theory makes sense with sisters knowing about it actually. Maybe brothers and husbands and fathers should know about it too. That humans are born with a natural innate psychological nature and a system which is called the attachment behavioral system. In the Quran, this is very similar to the word fitra, natural inclination. To be attached to someone you love, to give you this sense of security and belonging that motivates them to seek proximity to significant others. And he believed that the earliest bond formed by infants in their mother's womb and early childhood with their mothers have a tremendous impact that continues throughout their life and on their survival. He said, and he makes the link, thus attachment to God would lead to better psychological functioning. And he suggested that the closer the attachment to God is, the more reduced the mental illnesses are and the less likely that a person will commit suicide. Many, many, many more studies have been done and found this same comparison. That when you attach yourself to God and you have faith in God, it gives you security and your mental illness is much less than others. And he likened it to the womb. When the infant is inside of its mother, it has this attachment and it makes it feel this connection. And that is why people who don't know who their parents are they live a life with this emptiness. They're on a search. Where did I come from? Where are my parents and my instinct of security? Why did I bring this up? You see, brothers and sisters, interestingly, he says the reason why the baby finds an attachment with its mother is because the child wants to know who its caregiver is. Caregiver. And I'll give you one more thing. Those who are mothers who've had babies before, you'll understand what I'm saying. And those husbands who are invested in their families and in their wife during that time, you'll understand this as well. It is now confirmed through extensive studies that when a new mother, um, a woman becomes a new mother, when she hears her baby crying, a hormone in her brain is released called oxytocin and it releases milk. She lactates automatically. In fact, studies show that if she hears any baby cry, she lactates. I have a cousin in Lebanon. She is hearing impaired, deaf, and so is her husband. And they've got three babies. And she said to my sister, in the night I wake up for my baby to breastfeed it. My sister asked her, but how do you hear? And she said, I feel, I feel. Why is Sheikh Bilal mentioning all of this? Well, there is a connection in the Quran. This same connection, the caregiver, this feeling of security, the feeling of feeling safe. From childbirth, we have this instinct. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly reminds us of two things. Number one, what do we recite every time in Salat? Five times a day, each rak'ah. We begin with what? How do we begin our Quran? A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Then what do we say? Bismillahir Rahmanir rahim Then what does the Fatiha start off with? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil alameen. I've got a young man who's going to become inshallah something in the future. Rabbil Alameen. What is the word Rabb? No. Rabb does not mean God. What is Rabb? My brothers and sisters, 9,000 people here. Come on. What is Rabb? Not God. What did you say? Lord. And what does Lord mean in Arabic? Rabb. What is Rabb? Lord. What's the difference between Lord and God? What is the difference between Ilah and Rabb? Huh? The provider. 
the provider, the caregiver, the maintainer, the creator, the responder, the protector. They are all the actions of Allah. But when you say God, it means the one I worship. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always tells us to begin when we pray, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise and gratitude to Allah. It doesn't say, well, it says Allah. Rabbil Alameen, the Lord, the caregiver, the maintainer, the protector, the, cre the provider of the entire worlds. Allah begins by telling us He is our caregiver, meaning now you should respond. If you want to be feel close and you want to feel protected, any problem and any hardship you go through, turn to your Rabb. That's the first connection. And the second connection, every verse in the Quran which talks about your parents, if you read any verse that talks about your parents, what does Allah also talk about in that verse? He talks about himself. Always connects the relationship between us and our parents because they are where we came from and our connection with Allah. Doesn't mean your parents are like gods. It means that the reason why we connect with our parents is because that is our origin. And that is part of us. And that is why when we connect with our parents, we'll feel safe. And when we're disconnected from our parents or they are disconnected from us, we feel all sorts of problems and mental illnesses. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, the way you are connected to your parents and you feel your security and your identity strong and you feel safe, always remember the one who gave you your parents. Connect with him. Because that is exactly where you came from, from the beginning. Did you not hear the Quranic verse where Allah says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ Allah always tells us, and if my servants ask you about me, I am always close. I respond to the caller whenever they need me and call out to me. So let them respond to me. And let them connect with me. Let them secure their iman in me. In that they will find their security and guidance by knowing me. Brothers and sisters, how does Allah connect to us? And how do we connect to him? Through the ibadah. What is ibadah? Ibadah means worship. How does Allah speak to us? It's through the Quran. The Quran is Allah's language to us. Just like the mother's language to her child, Allah's language to us is through the Quran. Like the father speaks to his child, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us to the, through the Quran. There must be a connection, a speech, a connection, a language. Now imagine that you cut off yourself from the Qur'an. Then who have you cut off yourself from? Your Allah, your caregiver, your Rabb, your Lord. Who is the one who's constantly close to you? Allah, your Lord. So who is the one who needs to come close to him? You and me. That's why Allah says, respond to me. Where are you going? Why are you running away? Why are you running away? Stay connected to me. And I will guide you throughout the way. My brothers and sisters, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to a young boy by the name of Abdullah ibn Abbas. He said to him, I will teach you some words, young man. Do not forget them. He said, tell me. He said to him, Always keep Allah in your life and in your world and Allah will protect you and keep you near him. Keep Allah in your life, you'll always find Him in front of you. Meaning that you will always find Him there for you to call out for, to seek your security with. Inform yourself of Allah. Know Him when you are comfortable and at ease. And He will know you at the times of your hardship and discomfort when you need Him. وَإِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ 
If you were to ask anyone, ask Allah, meaning ask Allah first. And if you seek refuge in anyone, seek refuge in Allah first. The pen, the pen, sorry, and the ink has dried about everything that is to be, meaning nothing can change. Whatever has written will happen. If the entire creation were to be gathered in order to benefit you or harm you in something which Allah had not written to happen, they cannot. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, He said it again, Know your Lord when you are at ease and comfort. He will know you in times of hardship. And know that everything you hate in life, with patience and perseverance, not giving up, in that is so much good. The worship of patience. And know that victory only comes with perseverance and patience. Victory comes with what? Perseverance and patience. Not sitting down and making dua and the next day you expect the sky to open up and angels flutter down. No, no, no. It comes with perseverance and patience. You have to keep going. Like the palm tree, the Prophet ﷺ describes the believer like the palm tree. It bends with the wind and with the storm. And after the storm is gone, the palm tree is resilient. It stands up again. But don't, doesn't move away from its origin. Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَأَنَّ الْفَرَجَ مَعَ الْكَرْبِ And that relief comes, relief and opening comes with hardships and calamities. I always say this. A baby does not learn how to walk without falling. Forgiveness is not known without being hurt and wronged. Mercy is not understood without rights being taken. Good is not known unless you know the bad. Health is not appreciated without pain. Happiness is not hoped for and attractive without sadness. And love means nothing without loss. The only reason Adam alayhi salam ate from the tree was because he thought there's a secret that he's missing out on. But when he ate from it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him that curiosity for something which Allah had forbidden is not a good thing. Adam still learned something that he would have never learned before had he not accidentally disobeyed. And what is that? He learned mercy and forgiveness. Adam salam would have not known what it means. And we inherited it. Mercy and forgiveness is not known without mistakes and without wronging one another. Then we forgive one another and mend and watch. You know, between husband and wife, whenever they're upset with each other and they reconcile, the love is even better. You feel closer with relatives, with friends, anybody. So brothers and sisters, it is necessary for pain. It is necessary for hardships. It is necessary for loss. It is necessary for the negative to know the positive, for the bad to know the good, for the suffering to know the victory, for sickness to know what health is. Otherwise, how do you have all these amazing, beautiful people who stand up for justice, who stand up to heal, who stand up to protect, who stand up to really, truly live up to the meaning of love and make a shift in the world? Allah has given us the power. Allah has given us the power. Allah did not leave us like a little child who is spoilt. A spoilt child. Have you ever seen those spoilt children? Nobody wants to be around them. They think everything belongs to them. Because their parents pampered them rotten when they were little kids. They gave them everything until the children grew up and even don't even appreciate their parents, let alone anyone else. Through spoiling and giving someone everything will ruin you. And that's why Allah sometimes reminds us by taking away something. He takes away something and then something in here changes. Something in here changes. The only people who don't see the benefit of it are the ones who decide to think negatively about Allah. And not one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran which he has mentioned to us is negative. It's only negative because you think about it that way. 
But if you don't and you know that the Prophet Sallallahu said that Allah said, Ana inda abdi bi. I am as my servant chooses to think of me. Allah is not negative. Every name of Allah that you have ever read about, the 99 names of Allah, none of them is negative. And even if you hear a name that seems negative to you, always has a name before it that is positive. An example. When Allah mentions a negative name that appears to us, He mentions a positive name that appears positive to us. For example, Adar, what comes after that? What's after Adar? Al Nafi'. Adar means the harmer. Al Nafi' means the benefitor. Al Khafid, the one who demotes. What comes after that? Al Rafi', the one who promotes. Al Mani'. The one who denies, what comes after that? What comes after that? Al Mu'ti, the one who gives. In other words, the scholars said, Allah does not give you or allow for you to get sick unless He is going to heal you. He will not allow you to go through suffering unless He's going to give you something. He will not demote you unless He's going to promote you. He will not take something from you unless He's going to give you. When a person hits rock bottom, there's only upwards. The only one who chooses to stay down is you. We all hear those motivational speeches for those of you who have got ambitions and goals in the morning and you switch on YouTube and go to those motivational talkers. Say I can. That's what they say. You can do it. And the world is this and that. The Quran has already told you. Keep Allah in your life and you see all the doors opening. Brothers and sisters, do not be one of those who gives up when you hit rock bottom. For in the story of Musa alayhi salam is great lessons. You all know the story of Moses alayhi salam. He killed a guy from among the pharaohs. He was honored, respected. He lived a life of luxury and power with the pharaoh because of his wife Asya alayhi salam, among the most beautiful and, and among the most perfect women of the world. Asya alayhi salam. She looked after him. But when he killed someone accidentally, he became a fugitive. And he was going to be caught, arrested, and killed. In the story of Musa in Surah Al-Qasas, we read that Musa alayhi salam ran away. He ran away to another territory which the Pharaoh had no authority over. He went towards Madian. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this story. And then he says that he rushed, he ran away with nothing with him, no wealth, no food, no water. He lost all the kingdom and everything. He left his mother behind, his family behind, his brother behind, everybody. The hadith says that he reached a point in the deserts that his shoes, they all became broken. And his feet, the skin on his feet became peeled. And his stomach almost stuck to his back from hunger. And the only thing he was eating were the leaves of trees his tongue turned green. Allah says that when he reached, Allah says, when he arrived at the spring of Median, he found there a crowd of people watering their flocks. And he found apart from them two women holding their flocks back. He asked the women, what is it that troubles you? They said, we cannot water our flocks until the shepherds, the men, take their flocks away. And our father is a very old man, very smart young ladies. They said to him, our father is a very old man. He is a respected wise man. So don't get any thoughts. That's what they were telling him. At the same time, we need to come out to work. And there's nothing wrong with women working if there is a benefit and a need. And even if she wants to work for her ambitions, she can, so long as it's halal and within limits, insha'Allah. However, the story that I want to point out, the, the, the lesson I want to point out in there is not that. 
the point that I wanted to point out is to focus on Musa alayhi salam and focus on those two girls, these two ladies, whose father is an old man and they are desperately in need of going and doing the stuff that men have to do and they've got to mix with them. And at the same time, they're destitute. Musa alayhi salam is so much in need. As soon as they said, our father is an old man and so on and so forth, he could have told them, get me some help. Go and talk to him. I need help. But instead, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, فَسَقَى لَهُمَا ثُمَّ تَوَلَّا إِلَى الظِّلِّ فَقَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي فَقَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي لِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَقِيرٍ On hearing this, Moses watered their flocks for, for them and then returned in a shaded place and said, my Lord, I am truly in great need of any good that you might send down to me. You know, brothers and sisters, if you look at that image, any one of us will be seeking help. But Allah says that he quietly reversed into the shade and the darkness of the forest. And he sat there alone under a tree. And he lifted his dua to Allah saying, Oh my Lord, with respect, out of all the goodness that you brought down to me, I'm still in need. This is how we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of us, when we ask Allah, we say, Why hasn't Allah responded to me? I said, Oh Allah, give me money. He hasn't. Give me children. He hasn't. Save me. He hasn't. Cure me. He hasn't. No, 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 no. The prophets, when they ever asked Allah, they said, Oh Allah, with all the goodness and blessings that you have given me, meaning, have a strong mindset. Always remember the blessings that you still have because they're going to be your strength. Use them. But at the same time, request Allah's assistance for without Him, you, can, you are nothing. And then when he called out to Allah, he had hit rock bottom in other words. Yet brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then brought the young ladies to him from places he, least, he never expected. And they said, our father would like to reward you for the good that you did for us. And this shows you modesty in these young ladies. And Allah says that one of them came back with modesty and shyness. Not the shyness that you think. It's not the shyness where you ask a person what's their name and they don't know how to answer. It's the shyness of modesty. Meaning a modesty that she chooses who will hear her and who will see her, and who will get to see her other side, and who doesn't? That type of shyness, a self-respect. And she said to him, my father wants to reward you. So when he went there, we know the whole story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up a whole new world for him. He got married to one of them, and she was interested in him, and he was interested in her, and her father respected him, and held him in high degree, and he was well protected he were, his self esteem went up of course he was never down but he felt in need but his need was fulfilled number one through marriage number two through a place where he belonged and number three through working and earning a living Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up a door for him after he hit rock bottom and that's what the scholars tell us ma'ashiddati ya'til faraj with hardship comes relief. I want you to know something. The harder your life gets in something, know that the tougher it gets, the closer it is to relief. The tougher it gets, the closer it is to what? To relief. So don't worry. Don't worry. And rely on Allah and keep going. For this is a story and a lesson that Allah brings us in the Quran to comfort our hearts. And a story and a lesson in Ayyub alayhi salam. And a story and a lesson in Yunus alayhi salam. Yunus made a mistake. You might say Moses alayhi salam, he was a fugitive. He had to run away. It wasn't his fault. Yunus alayhi salam left his people without permission from Allah. And then when the big fish swallowed him, he said something. As Allah says, 
وذنون إذ ذهب مغاضبا فظن أن لن نقدر عليه فنادى فنادى في الظلمات أن لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين فاستجبنا له وكشفنا ما به من ضر فاستجبنا له ونجيناه من الغم وكذلك ننجي المؤمنين Allah concludes by telling us, and remember the story of the Noon, the man of the big fish, Yunus alayhi salam. When he left angrily with his people, and he assumed they had, he hadn't done anything wrong, and that we will not hold them accountable for what he did. And then he found himself calling out to Allah in his high pitch voice while he is in the darkness. O oh my Lord, there is no God worthy of worship but you. I have truly become among the wrongdoers to myself. To myself. The way out is to look inwards and say to yourself, what have I done wrong? So that's the other side. You cannot grow unless you are honest with yourself. Allah says, and so we saved him. We saved him from the gham. Gham literally means claustrophobia. And that's a metaphor for the claustrophobia of life. You know, when you say, I feel the whole world has caved in on me, whether it's from your marriage, whether it's because you're single for so long, whether it's from your children, whether it's from your parents, your friends, your work, your wealth, your health, it doesn't matter what it is. Min al gham. We saved him from the claustrophobia. We opened up the world for him. And like that, we also save and open up the world for the true believers. What does it mean, the true believer? Al Mu'minin comes from Amin, which means to secure in your heart the trust and the feeling of safety and trust and reliance upon Allah that He will relieve you. But you have to do your little part as well. My brothers and sisters, with hardship, comes ease. Inna ma'al usri yusra. With every hardship comes many eases. All it needs is sabr, perseverance. Perseverance, continue going. Don't give up. Don't just sit there and become a footnote, but work towards it. Rely on Allah. Do what is needs to be done and say, Oh Allah, I am with you and you are with me. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve all of you, my brothers and sisters, and all of our brothers and sisters around the world from all their hardships and to assist them with patience and perseverance. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change any hardship that you have into comfort and into goodness, any sickness into health, every pain into relief and every fear into protection and security. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our eternal and final abode in the most safest and secure and greatest happiness, Jannah al firdaus آمين وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
And may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As to what follows, my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for your attendance and reward the organizers of this event. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you success and goodness in this life and in the afterlife. I want you at the very beginning, deep within your heart, to say Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you Muslims. And then you say another Alhamdulillah deep from within your heart that Allah Azza wa Jal made you Muslims from Ummatul Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because I tell you something, it is always good to be a Muslim. Whether you existed in the time of Adam Alayhi Salam or Ibrahim Alayhi Salam or at the time of Musa or Isa Alayhi Salam. But the very best time in all of history to be a Muslim is to be a Muslim in Ummat al Nabi Sallallahu Alayhi Wasallam. And that is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lil nas. You were the best of nations to ever exist and come out and be produced to mankind. And Ummat al Nabi Sallallahu Alayhi Wasallam are the first people to enter the paradise bi idnillah. So alhamdulillah that we in our time in where it is the best to be a Muslim. My brothers and sisters in Islam, of course, the conference and the event is about the Quran. And I want, what I wanted to share with you in a few minutes is how Surah Al-Fatiha, the greatest Surah in the Quran, how can Surah Al-Fatiha cure our anxiety, depression, and distress, especially in this time where we are witnessing injustice and oppression and with inflation on the rise, and with tests and tribulations and calamities, each and every single one of us here has some sort of concern and worry that is bothering him in his life. And did you know that Surah Al-Fatiha offers a cure and a protection from these matters? This is what I want to share with you. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Quran as a shifa as a healer and a cure. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ He said, we send down the Quran as a healer and a cure and a mercy for mankind. And more specifically, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ قَدْ جَاءَتْكُمْ مَوْعِظَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَشِفَاءٌ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ more specifically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the Qur'an as a cure and a healer for what is in the chest. And that is the heart. And you know, this is where doubts are. This is where desires are. This is where ignorance is. This is where darkness is. This is where arrogance and hypocrisy and jealousy and hatred is. This is where depression is and sadness and anxiety and worry is. And so the Qur'an is a shifa for what is inside the chest. It is a shifa for what is happening inside of the heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to the Quran as a shifa, not dawa. Dawa is medicine. Shifa is a healer and a cure. And the difference is that medicine sometimes can work, other times it doesn't work. But a shifa is always 100%. It heals and it cures. Al-Quran is not a medicine. Al-Quran is a treatment. It is a shifa from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until the end of times. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Al-Fatiha is also known as Al-Shafiya, the curer, the healer. And that is because of an incident that happened with a companion by the name of Abu Sa'id Al-Khudri. He, alongside other companions, they were traveling and they arrived to a town and they requested food from the townspeople. And the townspeople refused to feed them. And at the same time, their master was stung by a scorpion or a snake or a spider, whatever it is. So they tried to cure him, they tried to heal him and offer medicine, nothing was working. 
So they went to those companions that they refused to feed. And they said to them, please, we've tried everything with our master and nothing has healed him up. Do you have anything? So Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said, I have something, but I will not offer it to your master until you pay us a tribute for our work and what we're about to do. So they agreed to give them a flock of sheep. And Abu Sa'id al-Khudri went to this man and he was laying there, venom in his body, about to die. So Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, he blew onto this bite, onto the wound, and he began to read Surah Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, until he reached the end of it. The hadith mentions, فَقَامَ كَأَنَّمَا نُشِطَ مِنْ عِقَالِ فَانْطَلَقَ يَمْشِي وَمَا بِهِ وَمَا بِهِ قَلَبَهِ he got up as though nothing has happened to him. He got up with absolutely no pain and injury with him. Allahu Akbar. Al-Quran was a physical cure for this man, for his ailment and illness. And it is also a spiritual cure as well. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said, I sat in Mecca for a while and I would get sick and I did not find any doctor or any medicine. So I would treat myself with Surah Al-Fatiha and I found an amazing, incredible effect for it. And anyone around me who complained of sickness and illness, I would prescribe for him to read Surah Al-Fatiha and they would also find incredible benefit, amazing for this. My brothers and sisters in Islam, I want to make a point, but listen to this very carefully. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Ma'arish, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ خُلِقَ هَلُوعًا the human being was created anxious. He's always terrified and worried and scared of the future. Whenever he is afflicted with evil, sickness, poverty, loss of wealth and health, loss of a loved one, a parent, a child, no matter what the case is, how does he respond? He is impatient. He becomes scared and he becomes worried and he loses hope of any good happening to him. That's the human being. And if he was touched with goodness, then he withholds, he's stingy, he's miserly. That's the human being. Allah said, Except for those who are committed to their salat, Allah will give them the strength and the ability for them to overcome the calamities and the anxiety and depression and distress in their life. The more salat you have in your life, obligations, voluntary prayers, al-witr, sunan al-rawatib, the more control you will have over your stress and calamity and anxiety. And the less salat you have in your life, then you will be overcome by your distress and anxiety and by your depression. Now, why did I share this with you? Because at the core of us salat, is Surah Al-Fatiha. That's the core of the Salat. Therefore, what gives you control over your calamities and your distress and anxiety and over your depression is Surah Al-Fatiha. And this is why Surah Al-Fatiha itself is called As-Salat. This is a name of it, As-Salat. And this is found in the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anh, he said that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah said, قَسَمْتُ الصَّلَاةَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي نِصْفَيْنِ That I divided a salat, meaning the fatiha, I divided it between me and my slave in half. So when the slave says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah says, Hamidani Abdi. Allah says, this is a conversation. There is a dialogue. You need to feel this when you're reading Surah Al-Fatiha in order for it to have an effect on you and treat your stress and your calamities and also your depression and your anxiety. When you say all praise belongs to the Lord of the worlds, Allah would say, Hamidani Abdi, my slave has shown gratitude to me. You know what that means? It means that Allah has acknowledged your gratitude towards him. You know, often, most of the times, we sit down and we say, did Allah hear our praise? Did Allah recognize it? Does Allah hear me? Can Allah hear me? Does he know that I'm praising him and thanking him? 
Yes. In Surah Al-Fatiha, he says, Hamidani Abdi, my slave has been grateful to me. So Allah Azza wa Jal acknowledges it. Then when the slave says, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Athna alayya abdi, my slave has praised me. Once again, Allah acknowledges your praise of him. You don't worry to say, did Allah hear me? Did he acknowledge? Did he accept from me? You just be concerned about reading Al-Fatiha. And the response is there. Yes, Allah Azza wa Jal has acknowledged your praise of him. When the slave says, Maliki Yawmiddin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Majjadani abdi, my slave has glorified me and honored me. And Allah has acknowledged your glorification of him. And when the slave says, Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een, you alone we worship and you alone we seek your help. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hadihi bayna bayni wa bayna abdi wa li abdi ma sa'al. That's between me and my slave. Look at the conversation now. It's become personal. It's like Allah is saying, this is between you and I. No one's involved in this. This is between you and me. And for you is what you ask. You haven't even asked yet. The asking of guidance is coming next. Ihdina salat al mustaqim. But because you've shown gratitude to Allah by saying Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen and you've praised Allah and you've glorified Him by saying Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawm deen now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy with the servant. He's pleased with the servant to the point where he says, and for my servant is whatever he asks for. You're in a position to ask now. So when the slave says, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمُ Guide us to the straight path. صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ Guide us to the straight path. Guide us to the path that you be, of those who you bestowed your favor and your mercy upon. Other than the path of those who earned your anger and your wrath and those who were misguided. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هَذِهِ لِعَبْدِي وَلِعَبْدِي مَا سَأَلْ that is for my slave, and surely for him is what he requested. And Allah Azza wa Jal continues to give us guidance. Whether you realize or you don't, that's because you're reading Surah Al-Fatiha at least 17 times a day in your salat. And you ask, why am I here tonight? Why have I chosen on a Friday night to come and sit when I could have done a million other things and listen to the word of Allah being recited and being explained? You know why? Because perhaps during this day, Allah Azza wa Jal, He heard that اهدنا الصراط المستقيم of yours and He's guided you. He guided you to this event so you can hear something that will benefit you in your relationship with Allah. Allahu Akbar. My brothers and sisters in Islam, let's take a dive ayah by ayah in Surah Al-Fatiha. I'll share as much as I can with you until my time is up. And let's extract how each and every single ayah helps us cure depression, anxiety, and distress. My brothers and sisters in Islam, when you read Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the first ayah in Surah Al-Fatiha, and of course there is a difference of opinion among al ulama, but there is no doubt that Al-Basmala has a heavy weight in Islam. So now, when you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, how does that treat? How does it cure? depression and anxiety and distress. Because when you say Bismillah, this ba is ba'ul isti'ana. You're seeking Allah's help. So now, in whatever calamity you're in, whatever is bothering you, you're being forced to seek Allah's help. That's what Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is telling you. It's telling you give up. It's telling you surrender. It is telling you you cannot do this life on your own. If you try to face life on your own, you will be in misery and you will fail miserably. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is telling you, face this life with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. And so there was a companion by the name of Talha ibn Ubaidillah radiallahu anhu. On the day of Uhud, he experienced a calamity. His finger was cut off. Imagine a finger cut off. You know what he did? He said, hiss. Yani he said, like this. That's a normal reaction. Anyone will do this. If your body was injured, 
Imagine a, a finger being cut. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard him. And he said to him, he said to him, Ama law qulta bismillah la rafa'atka al-malaika. He said to him, if you just said bismillah, the angels would have came and they would have raised you. Allahu Akbar. Face your calamity with bismillah before you utter words of pain in this worldly life. And just like Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was thrown, he was launched into a fire. And that fire is a calamity, no doubt. It is supposed to burn a person. He was launched into the fire. He didn't scream up in the air as he's landing. Rather, he said, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. He said, sufficient is for me, my Lord. And he is the best to rely upon. And what happened? Allah Azzawajal's help was with him. Allah Azzawajal made the fire cool and peaceful upon him. And just like Yunus alayhi salam, he ends up in a calamity, in the belly of a whale, in the darkness of the night, in the depth of the ocean. These are three darknesses. If he put his hand in front of him, he couldn't see it. He literally reached a rock bottom. And even then, he did not look for worldly means. And he did not rely upon himself. Imagine you are stuck in a situation like that. The first thing we do is we take the phone and the light and see how can I escape. He didn't resort to worldly means because he knows I cannot face calamities by myself. If I entrust myself, I will fail miserably. So he said, La ilaha illa ant subhanak inni kuntu min al he faced his calamity with Allah, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah azza wa jal would save him at the end. Allah said, فَلَوْلَا أَنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُسَبِّحِينَ Had he not been from those who praised Allah and worshipped Allah, he would have remained in the belly of that whale until the day of judgment. He would have remained in his suffering and his calamity. And he would have remained in his depression and anxiety and distress until the day of judgment. But he faced it with Bismillah. He faced it with the name of Allah. And Allah Azzawajal saved him. So when you read Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, it is forcing you to surrender and stop and face this worldly life with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah's aid is knee and it is close. And don't give up. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ajiba rabbuka. مِنْ قُنُوتِ عِبَادِهِ وَقُرْبِ غِيَرِهِ Allahu Akbar. Have you ever heard of this hadith? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Your Lord, he is amazed at the hopelessness of the servant. He is amazed when the slave gives up hope. And his change of affairs were very close and very near. But he gave up. Allahu Akbar. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And that's how it cures stress, distress, and depression and anxiety. We move on. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise and thanks belongs to Allah. And how does this ayah cure distress, anxiety, and depression? Because when you say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all praise belongs to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, it forces you to think of the blessings and to be grateful to them. You know, when a person is depressed and he's anxious, and he's in distress, what happens? That blocks, that blocks you from seeing and recognizing the blessings in life. Because you're just focused on what is concerning you. And it blocks your vision from the thousands and millions of blessings that are still working good for you in this life. So Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen is forcing you to change your attitude of gratitude. It is forcing you to be grateful to whatever is happening that is good in your life. Alhamdulillah, that you're still a Muslim. Alhamdulillah, that you still love Allah. Alhamdulillah, that you still love the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, for the eyes that Allah has given you. Alhamdulillah, for the health. Alhamdulillah, for many, many things that you have. I tell you something. There was a companion, his name is Abu, Abu al-Ash'af. Him and Shaddad ibn Aus, they both went to visit a man that was sick. 
They entered upon him and they said to him, Kayfa asbahat? How are you this morning, my brother? He was sick. You know what he responded and he said? He said to them, Asbahtu fi ni'mah. He said, I'm waking up this morning and I am immersed in an abundance of blessings. Allahu Akbar. Wa halil maradu ni'mah? Is sickness a blessing? What is this companion talking about? Of course it's a blessing. Of course sickness is a blessing. Because it purifies your sins. It elevates your rank with Allah. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, perhaps the servant has a rank and a level in the paradise. He will never ever reach with his salat, with his fasting and with his sadaqah. He will only get there through a calamity Allah inflicts upon him. Allahu Akbar. So this companion is aware of this matter. That is how Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen cures depression, anxiety and distress. It forces you to think of the good. And this is why in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even in bad times, he would say, Alhamdulillah, ala kulli hal. All praise and thanks belongs to Allah in every situation I'm in. Alhamdulillah is to praise Allah with love. That's what Alhamdulillah is. Because I can praise something without loving it. You know, sometimes you might have an enemy out there. He does something good. So you'll praise him and give him credit for what he did that is good. But you actually don't love him. That can happen. But Alhamd necessitates that you praise Allah with love. So when you are in your depression and anxiety and distress, and you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, internalize the love that you have for Allah Azza wa Jal, no matter what you're going through. There is a lot to be grateful for. There is a lot. And you know, when Allah Azza wa Jal tests a person, He says, Allah tests you with something. How can you reach that level of being grateful to Allah when you are in the midst of a calamity? Because you know, when a person experiences a calamity, there are four ways to react. You can either be displeased with Allah, you can either be patient, you can either be pleased with Allah, and the highest level in a calamity is to thank Allah for the calamity. You know how you can reach this? Because when Allah tests you, He tests you with something. And He leaves a lot of that thing that He tested you with. The only way you can reach this level is by focusing on what Allah Azza wa Jal left for you. Just like Urwa ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu. He had a, a disease in his leg, so it had to be amputated. And he also had a few children. He had about four kids. And they were coming to him. And one of them was thrown off the back of the horse and kicked and he died. So they cut his foot, they amputated his legs, his leg off. And then after uh, he woke up, they gave him the news that your son had died. So you know what he said? He said, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Allah Azza wa Jal gave me two hands and two feet. And he gave me four children. Then he said, Alhamdulillah, for what Allah has taken, and that is one limb of the two hands and the two legs, and he has taken one child. He said, Alhamdulillah for what Allah took, and Alhamdulillah for what Allah Azza wa Jal has left with me. That's the only way to reach the highest level, which is the level of hamd during a calamity, by looking at what else is left. When you lose some wealth, Say Alhamdulillah for whatever remains. When you lose some health, say Alhamdulillah for what remains. When you lose a loved one, say Alhamdulillah for whoever remains. And so on. That's the ID. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. When you say Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, you are forced to think of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how does this ayah cure depression and anxiety and distress? Because every single calamity you go through is injected with a lot of Allah's mercy, compassion, and kindness. Whether you realize it or not, Allah says, Allahu latifun bi'ibadihi. Allah is gentle and compassionate with his slaves. When Ibrahim alayhi salam was thrown in the fire, Allah made it cool and peaceful. 
That's Allah's compassion and mercy to Ibrahim السلام, during the calamity. Naam, this is what we're supposed to think of. Ayyub السلام, when he was bedridden for 18 years, couldn't move from his bed due to the sickness that was upon him. Even his, the whole community ran away from him. And he lost his wealth and he lost his children. He was alone. Only his wife was with him. She would carry him to the bathroom and back. And after 18 years, you know what he says? He says, Rabbi, Masani Abur. Lord, the pain has touched me. Wa anta arhamur rahimeen. And you're the most merciful. Allahu Akbar. I tell you something. All of us, in times of goodness, it's very easy to say Allah is the most merciful. But try to say it after years of calamity and suffering. Then at that moment, it will be an achievement. So when you're going through anxiety, depression and distress, and you say, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, you're fighting that evil whispering of a shaitan who wants you to doubt the mercy of Allah. So you realize that Allah is merciful with you. He's always been kind and good to you. You know Yusuf alayhi salam, Mashaykh were talking about Yusuf alayhi salam. I give you an information about him. How many tests did he go through? How many calamities did he go through? He was thrown in a well. He was separated from his father and his mother and his family. He was sold as a slave. He ended up in a fitna close to zina. Then Allah saved him. He ended up in prison. Calamity after calamity after calamity. And at the end of the surah, you know what he says? When he gathers his family, he says to them, وَقَدْ أَحْسَنَ بِي My Lord has always been kind to me. My Lord has always been compassionate and merciful to me. That's the attitude he had, even though he went through this entire life of calamity. So when you read Alhamd Rabbah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, you're forced to think of the mercy of Allah. وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ The mercy of Allah has encompassed everything. Why do you think it hasn't encompassed you? This is from the shaitan. And this is how this ayah, it cures depression, anxiety, and distress. My brothers and sisters in Islam, we don't have much time. I will share with you one more ayah. Maliki يَوْمِ الدِّينَ when you read Maliki Yawm din the king, and another Qira'ah, Maliki Yawm din the king and the owner of the day of recompense, of the day of accountability. How does this ayah cure anxiety, depression, and distress? Because when you read Maliki Yawm din you are forced to think of the afterlife. And you are forced to think of that day in which you will be standing before Allah. And you know what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says? He says, مَنْ جَعَلَ الْهُمُومَ هَمَّا وَاحِدًا هَمَّا الْمَعَادِ كَفَاهُ اللَّهُ الْهُمُومِ Whoever, whoever makes all his concerns into one concern, and that is the concern of the afterlife. You see, the best and the most healthiest concern and worry and anxiety you're supposed to have is the concern of the afterlife. Whoever made that his main concern, Allah will protect him from all worldly concerns because all of it will be inferior. What does a financial stress, what does that mean the day you die? And a relationship difficulty, what does that mean the day you die? So whoever makes his main concern the afterlife, Every other worldly concern will become less and inferior. It doesn't mean anything to you anymore. And that's how this ayah cures anxiety and depression and distress. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَمَنْ تَفَرَّقَتْ بِهِ الْهُمُومِ And whoever, whoever's concerns and worries are distributed in this worldly life, you're concerned about finances, about relationship, about health, about this, and you're immersed into that. Allah azza wa jal, he says, Allah doesn't care. Allah will not care concerning which of these worries causes your death and allows you to die and be destroyed. Allahu Akbar. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
that he allow the meanings of the Quran to penetrate deep within our hearts. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us relief and aid. And that we ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us our worships and our good deeds. Innahu wa liyu thalika wal qadiru alayhi. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakumullahu khayra. Wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. The Quran is a divine book. You know that, I know that. Something amazing I'm going to start off my speech by is all the scriptures. All those who are following divine books that they call divine. You and I know that the Quran is the most authentic by virtue of it not having been changed at all. Nothing was changed. And some people argue, no, this was changed, that was changed. Bring your books that are proven to be changed by the masses of today. And it's being changed constantly. You will find the Quran goes back to the furthest point. Even if you think and you claim that it was changed, which we don't agree, you will always find that it goes back further than any other scripture, the point of argument. So if you say it was changed, we ask you, when was it changed? You'll come up with a date, perhaps, according to you, that would be far behind the dates of the other scriptures being tampered with. May Allah grant us the understanding that this is indeed a divine book. Another beautiful point. The Quran is the only heavenly book wherein you find Allah Almighty or the one whose word it is, the one who revealed it is addressing the messenger and the messages for us. So he's addressing the messenger or addressing us. It's not a disciple talking. It's not someone else speaking. It's not a third party having compiled books and so on. The Quran has a uniqueness. And this is why those who've read the other scriptures, and I've read a lot of other scriptures, they would be able to tell immediately as they open the Quran that this is something unique because it has in it the direct addressing of the maker himself. So because the light upon light this year is themed upon the Quran and the divinity of the Quran, I started off by letting you know, indeed, it is an amazing book. It's the only book in existence that you can actually memorize from cover to cover without a single mistake. I know people who can read it, so many who can read it from cover to cover with all its stops and pauses and the different disciplines of learning within the recitation of the Quran, the translation of the Quran, without making a blunder. No other book, not even the short booklets that people write, no other book is memorized in that particular way. It's amazing. And Allah Almighty encourages all of us to make an effort to connect to His Word. Why? Because you and I were created by the Creator. For us to succeed on earth, we need to connect with that creator. And the only way to connect is by connecting ourselves with the word of the creator, his message that came to us, primarily the Quran. And the Quran will lead you to following the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. 
So understand that if you're part of the Ummah of the Quran, you're blessed. If you were to look at any other scripture that the followers might claim is our scripture or heavenly, so on, the Quran outshines all of them. And this is told even by the disbelievers from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You look at Al Akhnas ibn Shuraik, Abu Jahal, and the others who used to tiptoe in order to listen to the words, the beautiful, melodious recital of the Quran, the words of Allah. When they came back at one point, they had to admit to say, you know what? It has a sweetness, it has a beauty, it has some amazing meaning. It is absolutely perfect linguistically to the degree that the Arabs after revelation of the Quran began to use the Quran in order to correct their own language. Anyone who learns Arabic cannot avoid the Quranic verses because a lot of the rules and regulations of Arabic derived from the Quran. Yet Arabic precedes the Quran it is because the perfection of the language is indeed something worth noting from Allah, the word of Allah. The words of the Quran are amazing. Allah Almighty starts it in a unique way, even though the revelation of it through 23 years happened to be in a different order. And it's interesting to learn that order for purposes of understanding for purposes of looking at how Islam and the rules that were laid down came about. But the worship of Allah and the recitation of the Quran in prayer or as an ibadah needs to be in the order of revelation. So it is Surah Al-Fatiha and you read it as the Surah, even if there are some verses of Surah Al-Baqarah that might have been revealed later on, but they appear earlier in the Surah, you need to read it in a specific way. May Allah grant us a deep understanding. Now, did you know that every one of you seated here has contributed towards the protection of the word of Allah? Every one of you has contributed towards the protection of the word of Allah. You might want to know how. Do you know how? Let me explain. Who knows Surah Al-Fatiha? Put up your hand. Can we read it together? Repeat after me or with me, with me. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'een Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeem Sirat Al-Ladheena An'amta Alayhim Ghayri Al-Maghdubi Alayhim Walad-Dalleen Ameen who from amongst you does not know the Arabic language? Put up your hands high. Hi. That's the majority of you, mashallah. But what did you do? You read an entire surah of the Quran in Arabic, and I'm sure you know the meanings of those words, even though you don't speak Arabic. You don't really understand deeper Arabic, but some of these surahs, did you not make an effort to learn them the way they were revealed? If the answer is yes, congratulations, Allah used you to contribute towards the preservation of the Quran. People say, why do I have to read the Quran in Arabic in Salah? When I stand up in prayer and I say Allahu Akbar, and I have to read verses of the Quran in Arabic, I get asked a question, can I not read in English? And the answer is not in Salah. In the prayer, you have to read the Arabic. And then the question comes, but why? The answer is, we are taught to adjust ourselves in order to understand the word of Allah, not to adjust the word of Allah for us to understand it. You need to contribute towards the preservation of the book. And when you do that, you will be protected by Allah. Look, if you want to be protected every morning, every evening, you need to read certain verses. Who can tell me the most important one? Say it loudly. There you go. Ayatul Kursi, right? Do we know Ayatul Kursi? Put up your hand. Oh, there, the, the yes came. Mashallah, everyone. I put up both hands because I know it twice. Mashallah. Okay. 
Ayatul Kursi, we know it. We know Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Falaq, Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Nas. Imagine when you read these verses, you are automatically protected and wallahi you are. Now one wonders, how did Allah keep protection in repeating his words? Because the devil will never come close to you. Shaitan will never come to tamper with you. Jinn kind, jealousy will not bother you, affect you. Black magic will not bother you, affect you. Because what you have come, what you have come with is something that created a solid protection around you. And this even the enemy bears witness regarding. Subhanallah. It's the word of Allah. And this is why when Allah says, we have revealed this reminder we have revealed the quran and we will protect it it would mean if you made an effort to memorize it and it is in your heart allah has to protect you because you have the quran in your heart allah will protect you you don't need to fear anyone or anything. You have the Quran. So my brothers, my sisters, if you want to protect yourself and you want to improve in your confidence, you want to improve in your character and conduct, you must connect with the word of Allah. It does for you miracles. That which you may know, that which you may not know. And this is why Allah says, in this Quran and in its verses, in their meanings and in adopting what it says, you have cure for the diseases of the heart, cure for what lies within the rib cage or the chest. Allah Almighty has cure both physical and spiritual. In verses of the Quran, are you going to read the Quran? The difficulty is we don't connect with it. Soon, there is a month of Ramadan. How many days remaining for Ramadan? Does anyone know? How many days remaining for Ramadan? Anyone know? 60, what else? 90, what else? Can I tell you? Beginning of March, that's when Ramadan is going to start 2024, inshallah. I think the first, second week of March, right? Someone counted 73. I think they're right. 73, right? My brothers and sisters, that's the month of Ramadan coming. Many of us unfortunately connect with the Quran in the month of Ramadan, claiming that that is the month of the Quran. It is the month of the Quran in which the Quran was revealed. But Allah wants you to connect with the Quran for the entire year. Just like a person who's bothered about halal and haram only when Ramadan comes, but they're not bothered about halal and haram outside of Ramadan, that is a loss. That's a waste of time. You need to be bothered about halal and haram throughout the year, but more conscious of it in the month of Ramadan. So it should make you conscious of Allah, the book. Wallahi, I invite you this evening to do something amazing. We're ready for the invitation? Every day, start your day with at least a verse of the Quran. Did you hear what I said? I invite you to start your day with at least a verse of the Quran. At least one verse. Is it a good invitation? Mashallah, we're all saying yes. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah, we make use of the apps that are on our phones. I'm sure we all have apps on our phones that have the Quran. Am I right? It's written there so that we can read. There is an app I know, Quran Li. It actually counts for you. It counts for you a lot of the rewards and so on. Although you would be rewarded more than that based on your intention, but this is just the basic that's promised to you by Allah. And on top of that, it shows you the others who are also reading Quran in your contacts and how much they are reading every day and you can compete with each other in a good way. So that's just one, but there are so many other apps. The difficulty is we have at times multiple apps on our phones. We haven't made use of them. And then we say, you know what? I'm a Muslim. I'm connected to Allah. The first basic thing is the Quran. Connect with it. Then say, I'm a Muslim. Inshallah, I will follow as best as I can. Then we're speaking. But if you're, say, if you're saying I'm a Muslim and you're not connected with the Quran, there is something wrong. You need to improve. I need to improve too. So start your day with a verse of the Quran. And inshallah, if you do that, your life will change. Firstly, you can recite it. 
You can look into its meaning. You can ask questions if you don't understand. You can look into reasons of revelation. You can look into rules and regulations and so much more. One verse. I tell you the Quran has many miracles that come with it. Those who say, I don't have time to read the Quran. Read the Quran and see how Allah gives you more time in your day. He blesses your day such that when you've read Quran in that day, you will have a lot of time. The Quran creates its own time for you because it's the word of Allah. If you're dedicated, don't ever say, I don't have time to read the Quran. You say, no matter what, I'm going to read the Quran and then see how Allah gives you blessings in your time so that you can achieve so much through that day. And then another miracle of the Quran is when you start with one verse, you won't be able to continue just with one verse. It will continue to two and then three and then four and then more. So you end up reading a whole page a day. You end up reading more and then you start memorizing things. You know, I'm always baffled by how people, they want their kids at a very young age to learn every song that there is in the market. Whatever song is on Spotify, Dotify, whatever other fi there is, everyone's learnt it. And they learn the moves of the same songs on which app? On which app? Don't pretend like you don't know. TikTok, there it goes, mashallah. You see, we learn the moves. But I tell you what, without realizing that I could have spent my time learning verses of the Quran, when you have a little kid, the first things that you put into the sponge, it is taken in and absorbed more than anything else. And the life is being molded at that point. So when your life is being molded and whatever you're absorbing happens to be divorced from Allah and the message or that Allah has given us, what do you expect as an outcome? Rather, we let the child absorb beautiful recital of the Quran. Recently, I came upon, uh, across a lovely reciter by the name of Muhammad Al-Faqih from Yemen. Have you heard that name? No, you can check him out. A young guy. And subhanAllah, beautiful, melodious recital. I swear I could sit all night and hear the entire Quran, listen to it and concentrate. That's how beautiful the recital is. People ask me, who's your favorite reader? Can you guys say a few names? Who's your favorite reciter? Just call out names. Abdul Basit, Mu'aykili. Who else? Mushari. Who else? Afa. Who else? Anas al-Imadi. Who else? Look at all the names. Mashallah. Beautiful, right? I have a different favorite reciter in different moods. How's that one? I promise you, and I'm not cheating, by the way. Sometimes you listen to so many Haytham al dakhin for example, Hazza al blushi for example, this guy Muhammad al faqih I'm talking about a guy known as Ra'ad al-Kurdi, a guy known... So many reciters, one after the other, there are tons and tons of them available. And wallahi, I tell you, depending on your mood, each one will help you by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to calm down, to soothe, to fulfill that within you that needs fulfilling because you are connected with the Quran just by listening. Imagine if you are reading, imagine if you try to read with a melodious tone. I once told some people, a, a gathering, that you must make an effort to read with a melody. So one of the ladies messaged me later and told me, it's so difficult to read with a melody. I said, you have to, you must. It's only you. It's only you in your room. But instead of looking at the Quran and saying, it's not wrong to do that, but Allah wants you to beautify it. See the difference? Amazing. And the sister tells me about two weeks later that I can't believe the contentment I feel. I'm happy. I'm so happy. I was sad and depressed. I look forward to reading the word of Allah and telling Allah, Oh Allah, for you, I'm doing this. Listen, listen to this. Subhanallah. May Allah Almighty grant us ease. I remember one day I traveled with a certain brother and he sings nasheeds. 
And someone came up to him and told him, I know your nasheed, can I sing it for you? And he says, okay. And this little child singing the nasheed exactly the way the singer sings. And the child was excited, the parents were excited, the singer was extremely happy, and we were sitting there enjoying the moment. Something struck me later on. I said, imagine you and I sitting in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, I learned your word, I know the words, I want to... I, it's, not, it's not a song, so it's not a matter of singing. I want to recite them for you alone in the best possible way. Imagine how that would be. You see, are you ready to do that, inshallah? Wallahi, it will change your life. We're talking about the Quran today. We still have a few more days. Those of you who may not be able to attend the light upon light uh, events in the next few days you can watch it online inshallah but you'll see a continuation of what we started off here today in manchester by the will of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my brothers and sisters the quran has in it shifa <laughs> Guidance and mercy for believers, that's in the Quran. A reminder from Allah, the light from Allah, the guidance from Allah, shifa from Allah, cure for that which is in the chest. Subhanallah. All this from Allah. Reminder, Allah reminds you to do good things. Do you know anything that Allah has prohibited cannot benefit you? And anything that Allah has made an obligation has to be beneficial and will never harm you. So if Allah tells you, you need to stay away from X, Y, and Z, you do not participate in X, Y, and Z so that you can lead a beautiful life. Sometimes you may not understand immediately why Allah Almighty prohibited this. Sometimes you might falter and fall into X or Y or Z or both or three, all three of them or two of them. That doesn't mean that you are disconnected from Allah for as long as you know that Allah has prohibited this and I should not be doing it, but human weakness made me falter. Let me quickly come up and seek the forgiveness of Allah. You sought the forgiveness of Allah, you came back up and Allah says, you're back on track, don't falter again. But that's Allah. When Allah says something, it's because it's good for you, the way He said it. You might understand later on, there are so many things that we are looking at today and we realize the Quran is the truth. Today, we have thousands of people looking at the Quran, scrutinizing the words. Non-Muslims, people who probably hated Islam not too long ago, but because of what's happening in Palestine, and we pause for a moment to say, Oh Allah, help our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Oh Allah, grant them victory, grant them mercy, grant them goodness, grant them safety, grant them security. Oh Allah, we ask you to be there for them because we are so weak, we can barely be there for them. May Allah Almighty forgive our shortcomings and may Allah Almighty strengthen the Ummah so that we can stand up truly for our brothers and sisters who are struggling in Palestine. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. But if you look at what happened there, it caused... A, an interest in the Quran and in Islam. So many people began to look at it from the non-Muslims and guess what? They started turning to Islam in their thousands. Yet we who are predominantly born Muslims do not value the Quran. We don't value this message. You find these people coming and saying, you know what? I found something amazing. The Quran has answered my question. The Quran, wow. The Quran has spoken this and spoken that. We haven't even gone through its meanings. We should be embarrassed. We should be ashamed. And it's a fact. Because if you don't know the meanings of the Quran and you were born a Muslim and today you're 20 or 30 or 40 years old, you have indeed wasted your life. You've wasted your... You don't know the most important book the most important message in existence, you don't even know it. May Allah strengthen all of us. That's why I started off by saying, we, we are going to read one verse, a what? A day. One verse, a minimum. Beyond that, inshallah, Allah will take you and we will float and we will go ahead. My brothers and sisters, the Quran 
is a miracle. If you read a single letter of the Quran, you earn rewards, 10 rewards minimum. As you go more and more, you're getting more reward, more reward. The Quran has in it an amazing, unique power. The Quran has in it something that is inexplicable. You need to, you need to read it in order to feel it. And you will realize this is indeed the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah la yarfa'u bihaadha al-kitabi aqwaman wa yada'u bihi akhareen. Through the same book, Allah elevates some people. And the same book, Allah drops some people. You are connected to it, Allah elevates you. Look at those who are reciters of the Quran. We know them, we named so many of them. What is your connection with them? It's only that they can recite the Quran in a beautiful, melodious way. What is... Another connection, no other connection. There are Muslimin who can read the Quran. I've benefited from the recitation. I love this recitation. For example, Yunus, Aswelis, a guy from North Africa. What a lovely recital. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. A guy called Hassan Saleh, now based in America, reading so beautifully. What's my connection with these people? Nothing besides the word of Allah. So Allah elevates people through the Quran and then some are dropped through the same Quran. And that's why you find people, they spend their entire lives trying to find fault in the Quran. It started from the time of the Prophet <clears throat> They tried to find fault in the Quran, they couldn't. And they kept on picking on things, picking on, th it's going to happen right to the end of time. If you're a Muslim and you don't know the response to something that someone has said against the Quran, you need to learn it. You don't just become impressed by someone who supposedly found a fault. There are no faults. There is no contradiction, not at all. But the unsuspecting, those who don't have knowledge, they might think that, oh, these guys are quite, you know, they've studied and they found some mistakes, no errors. No errors, not at all. May Allah Almighty grant us the ability to understand how gifted we are. It has in it the news of those before us, the news of those who are to come after us, and the rulings of whatever we may require in our current lives. This is what the Quran has in it. It has prophecies of the future, it has the stories of the past, and it has the rulings rules and regulations that would apply presently. Everything is for a reason. And it is there because Allah wants to teach us lesson. I give you a quick example. There are thousands of prophets, those whom we know, those whom we don't know. Allah has mentioned in the Quran, how many? 25. Someone said 25. Well done, well done, mashallah. How old are you? 13, 14. I thought you were 25, mashallah. Nonetheless, mashallah. Allah mentioned 25 prophets in the Quran. But how many prophets were there? Were there not thousands of them? Allah says, وَلَقَدَ أَرْسَلْنَا مِن قَبْلِكَ رُسُلًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِمْ Allah says, before you, O Muhammad sallam, we sent messengers to their people. And in another verse, Allah says, مِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَصَصْنَا عَلَيْكَ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ لَمْ نَقْصُصْ عَلَيْكَ from among them, we told you some of, about some of them, some of their stories, and some of their stories we didn't even tell you. So if you look at the stories of the 25 alone that are in the Quran, which prophet of Allah is mentioned in the greatest detail in the Quran? Can you say his name? Musa alayhi salam, Moses, may prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be on him. Moses, may peace be upon him, mentioned the most in the Quran. And thereafter, who do you have? Isa alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, and so many others. How many of them does Allah mention the difficulties they faced when they told their communities to come towards Allah? Not all of them. Allah didn't mention the details of all of them, of their risala or the nubuwa itself. Allah, for example, Yusuf alayhi salam. You know his story, the most amazing story, an entire surah named after the Prophet Joseph, may peace be upon him. So many powerful lessons for all of us to learn. But Allah did not mention the deep details of all of his da'wah and how the people harassed him and so on. It was concentrated on a certain point. The same applies to some other prophets of Allah. Allah mentioned some of them in great detail. 
some of their struggles when they went to their people. Nuh alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam. Allah mentions much more detail about these prophets. With the Prophet Musa alayhi salam, Allah mentions so much. Now, why? Because Allah wants us to draw lesson from all of this. Some people will face different challenges and all the messengers did not face exactly the same challenges. May Allah Almighty grant us an understanding. I heard someone say that Jesus in Islam, I heard someone say that Jesus in Islam is more important than Muhammad وسلم, because he was mentioned more in the Quran. He brought together two things that are not to be brought together. So what if Muhammad وسلم, was not mentioned as much as Isa alayhi salam in the Quran? It doesn't make one more valuable than the other because of the number of times he was mentioned. If that was the case, then Musa alayhi salam should have been the most important. But that's not the case. And if that was the case, then Nuh alayhi salam should have been even more important and so on. But that's not the case. So don't let someone fool you to tell you this is what this means and that's what that means. You need to know, you need to learn, you need to understand, you need to enjoy not just the recitation, the meaning, look into it. You will learn so much that wallahi it will grant you a knowledge of Allah in an unshakable way. That's why Allah says, قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ Are they equal, those who know and those who don't know? Are they equal, those who know and those who don't know? They're not equal. Indeed, Allah Almighty knows the ones with sound intellect and knowledge. It is a reminder for them, a remembrance for them. Subhanallah. They are the ones who take heed. And that's why Allah says, Inna yakhshallaha min ibadihi al-ulama. The true people who are conscious of Allah in the correct sense and they fear Him in the correct sense are those who have knowledge of Allah. You don't know who is Allah and you don't even know the message of Allah. You've never made an effort to learn it. How are you going to be conscious of Him, the Creator who created you? Allah says, you know what? We want you to learn. When you learn more, you will understand the beautiful names and qualities of Allah. I want to spend the next 10 minutes of my speech, which is the end of my speech, on something amazing. Look, we're struggling across the globe. Every one of us has our own struggles. The Quran will help you, calm you down. It will soothe you. It gives you a lot of comfort and positivity. It reminds you, and in the Quran, Allah has done everything in a unique divine way. Allah starts the Quran, with a certain verse. What is it? According to some scholars, Bismillah rahman rahim is a verse of Surah Al-Fatiha. And according to others, it's not a verse of Surah Al-Fatiha, but you have to say it anyway before you start off reading Surah Al-Fatiha. So let's look at that. Bismillah rahman rahim I want to start reading Quran. Uh, what do I do? I say, A'udhu Billahi min shaytan rajim I seek the protection in Allah from shaytan the accursed. Why do I do that? I do that because Allah says, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ If you want to read the Qur'an, you need to seek the protection in Allah from shaitan the accursed. I want the benefit of it. I don't want shaitan to tamper. I want to be able to understand it. I don't want shaitan to tamper and so on. So I sought the protection in Allah from shaitan the accursed. And then I say, بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ I'm starting in the name of Allah. What does Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim mean? The merciful, the merciful. Two different types of mercy, right? The especially merciful and? And? Subhanallah, Rabbil Alameen. You can even say the most beneficent, the most merciful. The most merciful, the most merciful. Let me quickly tell you the difference between the two. Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman is the all-encompassing mercy of Allah that includes the Muslim, the non-Muslim, and every other creature of Allah. Allah is so merciful that He is fully merciful. But Ar-Rahim is a special mercy that Allah has dedicated towards the believers. So Allah says, the one, the especially merciful is Ar-Rahim. Especially merciful for the believers and the mercy that encompasses everything is Ar-Rahman. So Allah says, 
you should say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah, the one who is the most merciful, the especially merciful to the believers too. Subhanallah. When I start off that way, two things are highlighted, or three. Number one is I started in the name of Allah because it's His word anyway. And whatever you do that you are supposed to be, that, that is a matter of importance, you should say Bismillah. Kullu amrin. Kullu amrin dhi balin. Lam yubtada'u fihi bismillahi fa huwa aqta. Anything important that you are starting without the name of Allah, you're chopping it off. You're not going to benefit the proper way. So when you're reading the Quran, you say Bismillah in the name of Allah. Then I'm saying, the most merciful if Allah wanted he could have decided to have a different name or quality of his is a Rahman not a name of Allah it is you have a name of a human Ab Abdul Rahman the slave of the most merciful Abdul Rahim the slave of the most merciful right so a Rahman and Rahim are the names of Allah if Allah wanted he could have said the one who punishes, the one who is severe in his punishment. He could have said that. No, he wants you to understand he's merciful. When we start the Quran, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, the first thing we're starting is the praise of Allah. I'm praising him. Praise who? Praise my Lord. He made me. I'm here. It, indeed, all praise belongs to him. Everything is the ownership of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, I cannot start by avoiding the praise of Allah. I praise Allah in a holistic way. Alhamdu, all praise belongs to Allah. And who is Allah? The same two names and qualities that he named, that he mentioned earlier. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, ar rahmanir rahim If Allah wanted, it could have been different qualities. It could have, could have been a quality where he mentions his anger. He mentions how severe he is and so on. But no, Allah Almighty chose to say, most merciful, most kind, most forgiving, most compassionate, that is your Lord. So I want to tell you in the midst of all our struggles and all our suffering, never ever focus on negatives, focus on the positives and improve yourself. Connect with Allah. Allah is most merciful. Allah is most kind. So many people think, I've committed so much of sin that I don't know if Allah will accept me. Wallahi, those thoughts are from shaitan because Allah is waiting to accept you and I. May Allah forgive me. May Allah forgive all of us. And may we start a new leaf in a beautiful way. So my brothers and sisters, here we are with the names of Allah that he chose right at the beginning, being the most beautiful of names, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And so many times Allah speaks about how he is Ghafoor, Rahim, most forgiving, most merciful, Ghaffar, Tawwab, names of Allah mentioned in the Quran. Ghaffar means one who is oft forgiving. And like you and I, you forgive someone once, they do the same thing, you forgive them again, they do the same thing a third time, what happens? What happens? Yes, you won't forgive them. You become angry, upset. You want to roll up your sleeves and punch them. Spoke to Akhi Ayman the other day. He says, I'm not naked, my brother. I said, I know none of us are naked. He says, you don't even know what I'm talking about. What was he talking about? I don't even know. Maybe he needs to explain to us. May Allah forgive all of us. I think he's talking about... <coughs> you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. I am not naked because I have the Quran in me. It for me is a protection. It will protect me by the will of Allah. There goes. The question is, how much effort are we going to make to connect with Allah before we return to Allah? Here are the verses that Allah has revealed, giving us mercy, giving us hope in his mercy. Shaitan comes to us and say, no, 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 no. You've done too much. You can't turn to turn to him. People are struggling across the globe. Wallahi, if I don't change and if we don't change to become better people, to become amazing human beings that are, that are pleased with Allah and Allah is pleased with them. When the, when the Quran mentions the Sahaba, Allah speaks about two things. Allah is pleased with them. They are pleased with Allah. Are we not pleased with Allah? Whatever condition he keeps us in, Allah and Allah will be pleased with us. I love the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu taught us, "Man ahabba liqa Allah, ahabba Allahu liqaahu." Whoever loves the meeting with Allah, Allah loves the meeting with that person. I'm looking forward to meeting with Allah. Are you? Subhanallah. So Allah would be looking forward to meeting with you. And if you want to meet with Allah, prepare for that day by doing what? 
lots of istighfar. Oh Allah, forgive me. I'm a human. I, I faulted. I did wrong things. I have really done some embarrassing things. Oh Allah, don't hold it against me. I love you. I worship you alone. Forgive me. I'm looking forward to the day that you're going to take me back. I'm going to worship you and you alone for the rest of my life. When I meet you, grant me the best of the best of everything. And grant me the companionship of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Grant me the companionship of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah Almighty grant that to us. So you go through the verses of the Quran, you find the mercy of Allah. You find the goodness. Yes, there are warnings, there are reminders. But I tell you what, when you look at the mercy of Allah in the Quran, you immediately realize my Lord is the most kind, the most compassionate, the most amazing, the most loving, the most forgiving. That is Allah. He is my Lord. He is the one I'm going to turn to. Never allow anyone to make you become despondent as a result of a sin you've committed, something wrong you've done, or sometimes simply human nature. For as long as you know you're trying to please Allah, you know what's right and wrong, you're trying to focus, you're becoming a better person, you're seeking the forgiveness of Allah in preparation for the meeting with Allah, you're heading in the right direction. May Allah bless all of us. I really am so, so delighted to see these brothers and sisters all over, starting from that corner right at the top there, mashallah, all the way around to this corner. Right at the top there, may Allah bless you all. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.